can't be done outside of Belgium yet. Like, Mondial Ring is the sport that I do because it's the closest thing to Belgian Ring that's available here, right? Um, and so Mondial Ring is basically a hybrid of French Ring and Belgian Ring. They negotiated and kind of landed in the middle on those things. And because Belgian Ring requires two judges and there aren't, you have to bring two judges over from Europe, you need five dogs to hold a trial, right? And the difference in Belgian Ring from most of the other programs uh, is that the lower levels still have to do all the exercises. So it's not like in French Ring and Mondia Ring, at level one, you have a few exercises and it's easier. At level two, they add a few exercises, it gets a little harder. Level three, they add a few exercises and it gets a little harder. In Belgian Ring, all three levels, they do everything. All the jumps, two object guards, stopped attacks, all that stuff. It's just the trials get harder at each level. So in order to hold a trial in the US, you would have to get Belgian judges over. You'd have to get Belgian decoys over because people don't know how to catch Belgian ring dogs yet. It's a different style of work. And then you would have to find five dogs that had full programs, right? We're getting closer. To it. May maybe it could happen again now because we would have dogs from Mondia ring and French ring that could probably do the program. They wouldn't get full points on the gripping stuff because they've been taught to cat catch a different way kind of thing. But you could probably get them through a program. So maybe it's getting more likely that it could happen. In my old age, I'm going to lobby hard for Belgian ring in the US, right? Because I can still catch Belgian ring dogs when I'm 60, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Where it's getting increasingly hard for me to catch French ring dogs at, at field length. And I'm like, my knees won't like that. <laughs> anyway, so there you go. But generalization, back to it, because the Belgian ring has a lot of that as well. And I, I've become, I think, uh, uh, tangent, right? I'll give you warning signs, tangent, right? <laughs> so uh, in my, uh, in my uh, early education in dog training, I started in, in pattern sports, right? So IGP being one of the pattern sports, right? Uh, AKC obedience has a lot of patterns in it and exercises are similar and the rings look similar and those kinds of things, right? There's not a lot of focus on generalization in those things. And I think that there are intense values from those pattern sports because in pattern sports, you, it becomes about the details, right? Uh, because you're not changing the picture, they are gonna judge everything on perfection, right? And they're looking for a specific aesthetic. And so it teaches you to break things down in small pieces and be devoted to your rehearsal and making sure that the exercise is just right and controlling aesthetics. And that ability to break things down and focus on detail is a useful skill for any dog trainer, right? At a certain point though, and you know how to do it, it's just lots of repetition. And not that any kind of dog training isn't lots of repetition, it absolutely is, but as my career evolves and I got deeper into dog training, I became really interested in generalization. Like, can I get a dog to do this behavior in a lot of different contexts instead of can I get them to do it just perfectly with this exact choreographed routine? And that still has an allure and it's very nice when you see somebody that does that well, but I'm less interested in it as I get older and more interested in what's going on on the dog's head and how they problem solve. And what if a dog's put in a situation that they haven't seen? Could I actually create preparation that would allow them to succeed with things they've never seen before? And to me, that's interesting and it becomes increasingly interesting. So I'm drawn as I get older to problems of generalization. And so I'm having a renaissance of interest in, in police dog work and stuff like that. And there's a terrible lack of precision in that work. And there's lots of people that are doing bad dog training. So part of that, not deliberately necessarily, out of a lack of knowledge and time and resources, there's all kinds of stuff that factors in there. And, but that world can improve a lot. But it's also a really interesting generalization problem. Like those dogs have to perform a certain behavior in God knows what kinds of changing environments. And that becomes increasingly interesting. But I think ba looping back around to what we were talking about before is this idea that I have to recognize when my dog knows something and doesn't want to do it, they're failing because of a lack of commitment or disobedience versus a lack of understanding or a failure of generalization. And I need to be ready to help. And that's sometimes a clear cut, obvious thing. And sometimes it's not so clear cut and obvious, right? Does my dog know this or 
am I punishing a dog because I think you should know it, but I've changed something in my training in the picture that I haven't prepared you for. And I'm a little more sensitive to that now than I was when I was younger, for sure. Like where he basically said like, ah, you know this, I've done this enough, you should know this. And it was on me, but uh, there was something that I'd done to change the picture. And training dogs for lots of different generalization convinced me. I failed the change of position exercises at the national championships this year. My dog didn't do a single position, right? And because the way it was set up is, I, the judge knew this. <laughs> I set up, I cued the dog its positions, I put him in a down, right? They chose a down on purpose because you do a long stay in a down, right, frequently. And then they had you walk out of sight into this building that looked like a hide, like you would have to go out of sight for the long stay. And it had lattice, the rules say you have to be able to see your dog, but the rules don't say the dog has to be able to see you. And so I could see the dog through the lattice, but the dog couldn't see me, right? And I've done stuff where the, I'm, I've got my back to the dog, they can't see my face, I'm ducked down behind things, and my head's peeking over, all that stuff. But I hadn't gone completely out of sight to do it. And so, sit. He just lays there like, mm, I don't think so, I think I'm doing a stay, right? <laughs> and so, I'll cycle through all, think, bip, 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 it's over. So there, there's my 20 points gone, right? And so that kind of thing is fascinating. Like, I've done this a long time and prepared a lot of dogs for things, and you're like, oh yeah, mm, it's a hole there. Like, <laughs> I haven't practiced that enough, obviously, right? And so, but is that him saying no? Do I go back and start frying him for that? No. I go back and show him that, and I help him. And I help him look through it. And two, two training sessions, and he does it perfectly. Now, no problem. No correction happened anywhere there, because that's a failure of generalization. Yeah, I didn't do my job. And sometimes you show the dog that, and some dogs made the leap for you. And it's awesome. It's cool. It feels really good. Like, I've done my work to prepare you, and now you're presented with a novel problem, and you solved it the way I would like you to solve it. That's cool, right? But we have to be sensitive to that, because lots of dogs experience a lot of stress and pressure because we're doing that to them. We post our social media videos to our website, Learberg.com a week or two before we post them to our YouTube channel. These early release videos can be found on the front page of our site or by going to the site and selecting video on demand from the toolbar and then select free videos. Thank you for watching.